Let's turn to our Heidelberg Catechism to read together the second Lord's Day. Lord's Day 2 begins the first part of the misery of man. Whence knowest thou thy misery? Out of the law of God. What doth the law of God require of us? Christ teaches us that briefly in Matthew 22, verses 37 through 40. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first and the great commandment. The second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Canst thou keep all these things perfectly? In no wise, for I am prone by nature to hate God and my neighbour. You will notice, beloved, that in Lord's Day 2, we have the first way in which our sin and misery is spoken of in our Heidelberg Catechism, namely, hatred. Answer 5 says, I am prone by nature to hate God and my neighbor. Why is it that hatred is the first way in which our Heidelberg Catechism speaks of our sin and misery? And the answer is, Because the previous question and answer, number four, describes our calling with regard to both God and our neighbour as that of love. And our inability to love God and our neighbour of ourselves is our natural fallen ability to hate. Now, in exposing man's hatred so prominently too, the Heidelberg Catechism might sound a bit like the modern preoccupation with hatred in its criminal codes, in the news, in popular speech. We hear ad nauseam about hate crimes and about hate speech and about the various phobias which are about various forms of hatred. And it's interesting with an issue like this to maintain some historical perspective because in our fallen world over history the world's approach to crime and ethics keeps on changing and mutating. I mean, it's always enmity against God, but the form it takes changes and mutates. And the modern preoccupation with hatred is very unusual. And it is a very relatively recent phase, what we're currently experiencing this Emphasis on hate. I mean, the world is full of hate. Hating and hating one another, it says Titus 3, verse 3. So it's ironic to have the world talk about, about hatred. And one wonders, how did this modern emphasis on hatred arise? And the logic is the same as the logic in our Heidelberg Catechism. It's the logic of the connection between question and answer four, which deals with the calling to love, and question and answer five, which deals with hatred, although it's in a different form. That is, in the last generation or so, the world has been busy reinventing and redefining love in subtle and not so subtle ways. You must love yourself. 
And if you can't love yourself, the world says you can't love other people. Utter nonsense. You must never physically chastise your children. And physical chastisement of children is hatred. And it's love just to let them do whatever they want. That's what some in the world, not everybody in the world, but some have been and are saying. Love is fornication. Love is adultery. Love is homosexual coupling. Love is homosexual marriage. Love never condemns what used to be called sin. Now since hatred is the opposite of love, then hatred also has to be redefined. This is the wool that's being pulled over people's lives in our society. We're getting brainwashed and force-fed this stuff all the time. Hatred of sin is a bad thing. Love of sin is a good thing. Love of sin is love. Hatred of righteousness is a good thing. That's love. Love of righteousness is a bad thing. That's hatred. Listen to Isaiah chapter 5. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. And all this is important, beloved, because you need to know about sin. That's the teaching of our Heidelberg Catechism. You need to know what sin really is, what does incur guilt, and what really does bring shame. And you must know what is not sin and what does not incur guilt before God and what is not sinful because people are mightily shaped and even controlled by wrong views of evil guilt and shame controlled and manipulated and so you need the right standard for determining right and wrong and it's not modern political correctness it is the <coughs> law of God whence knowest thou thy misery whatever the BBC tells me no out of the law of God and the gospel is at stake here because of the inextricable link between what the Reformed have always coupled in a standard phrase, law and gospel. Law shows us sin, and in the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have forgiveness of the sins that the law reveals. And someone who is all hung up about the transgressions of this modern notion of what's right and wrong, and it's incredibly modern, someone all hung up about these transgressions of political correctness, has no gospel, is immunized against the gospel. And there is no forgiveness of sins in the blood of Jesus Christ in the worldview of political correctness. That's what the worldview of political correctness means to exclude. That's the idea of it. Shift the thinking of generations from the truth in order to control people and make the world after a new image. The world keeps doing this. It's tried it every generation. And this is the new form of it. And our children need to grasp this too or else they will be carried away by humanistic mantras, especially since they're young, and though they hate to hear this, they are thereby 
the easiest to lead astray and once they're carried away by humanistic mantras God's law doesn't mean anything doesn't, doesn't make sense and the Christian gospel just doesn't, doesn't fit and so it is our comfort and our happiness in the triune God that is the issue here and the comfort and happiness of our children question and answer two reads how many things are necessary for thee to know that thou enjoying this comfort mayest live and die happily three things first how great my sins and miseries are and god tells us what they are in our word second how i may be delivered from all my sins and miseries And the third, how I shall express my gratitude to God for (coughs) such deliverance. Thankfully, the happiness of the Christian and his comfort in Jesus Christ has nothing to do with the latest inventions and new laws from the radical left. And these things must never bind your conscience. To echo Galatians 5 verse 1 Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made you free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. But all this doesn't mean that there is no real problem with hatred. Oh, there is a problem with hatred. (coughs) Massive problem with hatred. There is a far bigger problem with hatred than the world has ever dreamt of. There are far deeper problems with hatred than the UN has ever imagined. Because it's bringing up a substitute hatred to take people away from the real hatred that is the crucial problem. And hatred is also far more intractable than they have ever ever realized there is no law that can stop out hatred there is no punishment that can erase it there is no brow beating that can take it out of people there is no equality training that can restrain it or brainwashing uh, you might sweep it onto the carpet a bit and what I mean is this This is the confession of every Christian, and specifically now every Reformed Christian, this, that fallen man is prone by nature to hate God and his neighbor. Our subject this evening is prone to hate. First, the hatred of God, and second, the hatred of man. We're prone to hate God And we're prone to hate man. Romans 1 verse 30 describes fallen human beings as haters of God. Haters of God. And in the argument of the second half of Romans 1, which we read together, this hatred shows itself first in idolatry. Everyone, even the utterly unreached heathen, know fine well that there is one true God who is invisible, eternal, and almighty, the creator of all things. Verse 19. (coughs) That which may be known of God is manifest in them, For God hath showed it unto them. It's dealing with the unevangelized heathen. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and Godhead. So that they are without excuse. That is the creation clearly reveals the creator. It is unmissable. 
so that everyone is left without excuse. And now, what does fallen man do with this? He doesn't glorify God. He doesn't thank him. Verse 21 continues, Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. And instead, fallen man does this, he makes idols. He makes idols as substitutes and replacements for the true God. He makes idols in order to bury the knowledge of the true God and not in any way an effort to approach or find him. And there are various types of idols depending on the time and place and inclination of the idolater. For some, you make your God in the image of a man or a woman. The ancient Greeks did that. For others, it's birds or beasts. For some, it was cats like the Egyptians or insects. Even the Jews fell into that in Ezekiel's day. And so we read in verse 21 that they became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Verse 25 sums it up. They changed the truth of God. You could even say they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And they worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And this is what Paul means when he says in verse 18 that man holds the truth in unrighteousness. He holds it down. He suppresses it. By exchanging a lie for the truth. And all of this is hatred of the true God. It is hatred of the true God to refuse to honour and worship him. It is hatred of the true God to replace him with idols. So as to get rid as far as possible of every thought of him. And it is hatred of the true God. To degrade him as if he were like a man or an eagle or an ox or a cockroach or a spider. Now in Protestantism the hatred of God has shown itself and grown over the centuries through the development of sin and apostasy with respect to God's works. The chief and central work of God is salvation. And that was taught in the Reformation truly and purely. But again this subversion of the truth, this exchange of the lie for the truth was soon operating again. Salvation isn't determined by God, oh no, it's determined by man. Man is, has the decisive vote, so it's by man's free will, so-called, or man's works. And this is hatred of God, hatred of God's sovereign work, hatred of the work of God the Father, especially, chiefly, in election, accompanied by reprobation, hatred of the work of God the Son in his atonement, and hatred of the work of God the Spirit in his effectual calling and drawing. So Protestantism suffered a mighty blow in the form of what we call Arminianism in its hatred of the sovereign God in his work of salvation. Then, this is even the way it played out historically, by and large, 
Then there was a hatred of God's work of providence. God doesn't really govern all things. God doesn't really govern small things. God doesn't really govern sinful things. And this is deism's hatred of the God of providence. And then, especially in the 19th century, the attack on the God of creation. God didn't make things in six days, as he says in his word. It all originated in the old, tired, boring story of the huge explosion, and uh, you can spin it out, which is evolutionism's hatred of the creator God. What is there left for God to do? He isn't the one who saves. Oh, he's a part in that. But salvation isn't wholly of the Lord, as Jonah confessed. He doesn't govern the universe. He didn't create the universe. What is there left? Well, maybe he judges. It's the only work left to God. But then... To obliterate that work of God, it has become increasingly popular to argue, in fact it's, a, it's an assumption, an unquestionable assumption for most people, that God, if there is a God, is all love and only love. And God's love is defined as an almost complete moral indifference to sin. So that God... It's fearing on blasphemous even to state this view. But God is only allowed to be against what the anti-Christian left is against. It's amazing. Surprise, surprise. If God's against anything, it's not what he says in his word. It's what the anti-Christian left thing. In fact, God is for, strongly for, and God loves the sins of which are, lo and behold, the very ones that are most defended and promoted and praised today. And this is hatred, violent hatred, of the just God, who is the judge of all the earth. He's not the saviour. He's not the governor of heaven and earth. He's not the creator. And if he exists, he's not the judge either. Now notice several points made by our catechism. First note, the first and chief object of hatred, according to the Reformed faith, is not man, or woman, or children. And of course it's wrong to hate men, or women, or children, obviously enough. But the first and chief object of man's hatred isn't even some minority or some protected group, however deserving or undeserving. It's God. I, says the Reformed Christian, am prone by nature to hate God. Many of you, no doubt, will have heard the recent blasphemous statements of Stephen Fry. He argued that he was surprised that people were troubled by his despicable remarks, but said that he wasn't guilty of any wrongdoing because his charges were not against any specific group, but they were actually against God. So anything to do with speech, if it's against God, can't be wrong. But if it's against a religious group, then you might be in trouble. And we have reached what is practically the exact opposite of the blasphemy laws. It used to be that it was wrong to say things against God. But now the blasphemy is if you say anything against what against those who are, who are most strongly against God. 
it has turned full circle. And laws have a, a momentum. They carry their way. Notice second how hatred is defined. It's not defined by man's laws, whether they're politically correct laws in the 21st century or the 20th century laws or the 19th century laws or the 18th century laws or any laws. Hatred is defined by God's law. Question and answer three, how do you know your misery out of the law of God? Question and answer four, summarizes the law of God. And question and answer five, when it says, canst thou keep all these things perfectly, it means the various laws of God, which are summed up in Christ's great statement, which is the first and the great commandment to love God. The first and the great commandment. And that's what our modern society wants to take us away. All, if there's any such thing as a bad law, and this is inadmissible, probably even in any form in the debate, it's God's laws. You can't bring them up. That's almost discrimination in itself. Third, we need to note man's total inability to keep these laws. Answer 5 says, I am prone by nature to hate God and my neighbor. I am totally unable to avoid hating God. And I am this by nature. And so the Christian, when the Christian deals with this issue of hatred, the Christian thinks, yeah, we, we know all about hatred of God and hatred of man. We'll come to that in a minute. You know what the problem is? Original sin. Original sin that by nature I hate God. That's total depravity. The world talks about a systemic bias in various societies and organizations against this group or that group and all the rest of it. And the Christian faith teaches that there is a systemic bias in man, in every man, in every organization. And that God is particularly interested in this chief systemic bias, the inward hatred of himself through original sin. Remember I said earlier, Applying Paul's word in Romans 1 verse 18 that man subverts the truth and he substitutes. There's a substitute hatred going on and there's a substitute love going on. There's a substitute law going on where we're continually being offered here. Let this take the place of what God says in the word. And it's a switching of God for idolatry. Because idolatry comes in many, many forms. The fourth thing we need to note is that this hatred of God constitutes man's sin and misery. Man's misery is not poverty, though that's a wretched thing. It's not social exclusion, though everybody feels it in various levels and situations. And the way the world's going, I'm feeling it more and more too. It's not a lack of tolerance, that's the great misery of the world. The misery is breaking God's law. And that's the first part of man's sin and misery, hating God. And the world can't understand this. And that's why it rests on what is a superficial view of misery. It's dealing with the surface. With the sur- it never goes to the heart of the issue with its views of hatred. And fifth, we need to note that this statement about hatred is a confession of sin. You will have noticed, the mess your heads in the sand, that in our society, great pressure is put upon people if they cross some real or imaginary boundary. Great pressure. People who are high up, they must kowtow too if they break these laws. 
The papers attack them. Cries go out that they must be sacked or that they must resign. And at the very least, they've got to apologize and grovel in the dirt for whatever they did, whether it's some real offense or some other offense. Because the world actually, in its current form, is actually mirroring issues of love and hate and even confession. But God in the gospel speaks of the confession of sin. Such a confession is centrally and chiefly to him. And there are places where confession to other human beings and to the church and even other organizations. But confession is chiefly to him. And that it's confession of sin as sin and hatred against God. And it's a confession not, I'll have to say this and then get the press off my back, but confession with grief and abhorrence of sin as sin against God. And it's a confession which is accompanied by trust in Jesus Christ the Lord and the reception of mercy in the forgiveness of sins. The cancellation and blotting them all of them out and peace with God. And the world's confession or its substitute of confession is taking people away from that real, that real confession that must be made. Now what about us, beloved, and our hatred of God? <coughs> Pre-conversion, you and I hated God just as much as everybody else. So we know of what we speak, because that was us. Children of wrath, even as others. Post-confession, that is, after we're brought to the knowledge of Christ, our old nature hates God. 100% enmity against God in us. And, though we battle against it, we are acutely aware of this hatred against God because it keeps rearing its ugly head it shows itself in a weariness in worship. <sighs> when is that man going to quit? It shows itself in a sinful neglect of prayer that we don't love God the way we say we do because we don't want to come near him. It shows itself in our grumbling and complaining which was the great sin of Israel in the wilderness wandering and reflected their unbelief. And it showed itself, shows itself in how pitifully weak, even at the best of times, is our delighting and praising and thanking of the triune God. But grace, grace works in each and every child of God so that we do make this confession. Can you keep these things perfectly? We've heard you say that the world can't keep them, and that's, that's useful to know in case we're deceived. But can you keep them? In no wise. Not, not, no, I can't keep them. I'm prone by nature to hate God and my neighbor. I personally. And I am so prone to hate God and my neighbor that I wouldn't even be making this confession. I'd be that evil. But for the fact that the word of God and the spirit of God taught me this inwardly. So that I now do utter this truly from the heart. And all of God's elect do make this confession of hatred. Hatred against the true God according to his word and from the heart. The catechism, beloved is right in its order when it speaks about hatred. It talks about hatred of God and then hatred of man. Answer 5 says, I am prone by nature to hate God and my neighbor. It's right in putting that first because this is also the order, repeatedly, in Romans chapter 1. 
Romans 1 verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, especially now sins that are directly against God, and unrighteousness, the sins against the other commandments, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold or hold down or suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And when you move on to the rest of Romans chapter 1, you'll see that sins against God are dealt with in Romans 1 verse 19 and following, and then sins against man in verses 24 and then 26 and following. It's the same, the same order. And if you ask, how is man's hatred of man shown, first of all, in this second half of Romans 1? The answer is sexual sins. And this is the way it was in the pagan world in the first century AD when the Apostle Paul was inspired by the Spirit to write this chapter. And this is exactly the way it is in pagan, politically correct, 21st century Western Europe. The hatred of man, this would appall them, this would mystify them. The hatred of man is especially shown in sexual sins. And they say, no, 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 this is how we show we love each other. No, it's not. Verse 24 could be said to deal with heterosexual sins between a man and a woman. Wherefore, for all their idolatry, their sin and hatred against God, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. That's a very sad, sad word. God gave them up to that. The sins of fornication, the sins of hatred, of adultery rather, the sins of divorce and remarriage when one's spouse is living, precisely the things which our world today calls love. Love. Fornication, adultery, divorce and remarriage. Love for your husband or wife. Love for your children. That's love. Pornography. And even the pornography of children. And it's strange, it's a glaring inconsistency that the world is okay with the former. The world thinks pornography is a good thing. Let's keep it from the children now, but it's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. As one of the leading pornographers said it, America, that's the same for most countries, couldn't live without pornography. And yet it's strangely opposed to the latter. Child pornography. Some of you may have seen the fall from grace of Gary Glitter. And this man was engaged in wicked sexual acts with children. And I saw a news clip when the man was cavorting with naked women and boasting about his sexual immorality and how many women he'd laid with. And then the world seemed to be puzzled. Puzzled that then he engaged in sexual acts with children. Now it's obviously the case that not everybody who does the former also does the latter. But the connection's there. You give re free rein to your lusts with women, many women. And then eventually you get tired and bored with it and you want a little bit more excitement. And you say, I'm going to chance my arm with younger ones. The world can't work that out. The world is moronic. And then too, and this is becoming more and more commonplace in our society, even debased and degrading forms of sexual activity and these sexual sins are lust and hatred of the person whom you degrade and use for your own gratification it's not love it's hatred and if we move from the heterosexual 
sins of verse 24, we come to the homosexual sins of verses 26 and 27. First of all, lesbianism between women, verse 26. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And then sodomy, verse 27. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and shameful, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And this is hatred. This is hatred of God who made us male and female. This is hatred of God who determined it such that sexual relations are only between males and females and only within marriage. And this is also hatred of the other homosexual person whom you use for your own lusts while he or she uses you for his or her own lusts and you both degrade each other into hell. And the remainder of Romans chapter 1 shows many other forms in which hatred of man shows itself. Verse 28 Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, they don't want to know about God. That's dealing with the homosexuals. Homosexuals don't want to know about God, not the true God. It's part of their sin. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Again, hatred of God leads to the hatred of man. Here we go, verse 29. Being filled, filled, mind you, with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity. Hatred here shown with the tongue, amongst other things. Whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, Proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. There's hatred of one's own father and mother. Verse 31, without understanding, covenant breakers, they break their word, without natural affection, since they're filled with hatred, implacable, unmerciful. Well, that's hatred and not love. And then verse 32 adds, who knowing the judgment of God, because even the worst of men, those who give freest expression to their wickedness, they still know the judgment of God. They have some witness in their conscience and they understand that they're going to be held accountable. Even though they know the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, even eternal death, they not only do it themselves, but they have pleasure in them that do them. And the word for that in our society is the entertainment industry. Pleasure in those who do these sins. Not only is there the most money to be made in sin, but there's the most, there's the most pleasure for fallen, depraved man in sin. They not only do it themselves, but they enjoy seeing other people do it. And on the last day, we will see the hate sins of man exposed, exposed. And it will be far more wide-reaching and far more detailed than anything Operation U-Tree or any of those exposés of the sexual deviants and perverts who have been arrested and criminalized in recent times then the question is what about us how do we fare in Romans 1 28 through 32 you might be tempted to say oh we didn't do too badly oh that's not the point 
Look at the next verse. Chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art the judgest, ministers, Christians, all of us, for wherein thou judgest another, and we have to agree with the word of God that all those things are sins, yep, those who do it, they're sinning, yep, wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. How, how, how? For thou that judgest doest the same things. You do them too. I do them. They're in us. We don't fight against them the way we should. We yield to temptation. And our only hope, this is the message of our catechism, as it is the message of the Christian gospel, is to go back to the start of the passage we read. Romans 1, 16 and 17. Here's Paul. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He's coming to Rome, the capital city of that mighty empire. Where were the great thinkers and philosophers? Where were the politically correct of their day? And they had this great moral system. And they knew right from wrong. And they had this great jurisprudence. And everybody has to kowtow to them. And Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It can hold its own with the wisdom of the world. It's quite a bit better than the wisdom of the world. And the wisdom of the world is foolishness. But I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it's the power of God to salvation not for everybody it's the power of God of the salvation to everyone that believes to some people the gospel seems to be the weakest thing in all the world the most worthless foolish nonsense but it's the power of God of the salvation to everyone that believeth and others don't understand the mystery to the Jew first and also the Gentiles and how come it's so powerful well it's so powerful Because it reveals to us the one thing that man needs, righteousness. Because there's none righteous, no, not one. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because therein is revealed the righteousness, not of man. He doesn't have any righteousness. He can't attain to righteousness. The righteousness of God is revealed, the righteousness which God obtains in the life and obedience and cross of Jesus Christ. A supernatural, divine gospel with a righteousness that's revealed not to everybody that's revealed not to the clever people but it's revealed from faith to faith if you believe it it's crystal clear the son of God kept all the laws and he gives that righteousness to me merely by believing and trusting in him and so it's written the just shall live by faith trusting in the righteousness of another who bore our sins And obtained for us a legal standing before God. And this is the good news to those who are outside of Jesus Christ when they trust in him. Even for the very first time. No matter how debased. Or no matter how deceived. No matter if they've committed everything in that whole chapter that we read. All the filthy sins. All the way to verse 32. And many times. And publicly, forgive him. Every last one of them. And that too is part of the offense of the gospel. And it's the same gospel. And we who believe and have believed it for years and decades, and several decades, we're still not ashamed of it. It's the power of God unto salvation every day. We trust in that righteousness. And it's our confidence and hope in this coming week. And on the last day. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven. Even as we look at the debauchery of the world. And look within and see these lusts and evil inclinations in ourselves. We give thanks at a righteousness which came from above. A righteousness which was wrought out below. And a righteousness which is imputed to us. And a righteousness which will be publicly exhibited at the last day when we will stand in the judgment, not because of our own deeds, but because of his righteousness. Give us this confidence that we may not be ashamed and bring many more to the truth of thy gospel according to thy riches and grace. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.